Hello, I'm David Blankenhorn. Welcome to The Conversation, sponsored by the Institute for American Values. I'm so happy to welcome to the table tonight John Corvino. John, is I'm great to have you I'm very pleased to be back. Yeah. Um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation. We have a lot to talk about. We have a lot that's happened and yeah. since the last year. I, I was here last year with Maggie Gallagher. Yeah. You're a New York City boy originally? I was born in Brooklyn, grew up mostly on Long Island. Grew up on Long Island, uh, one of those big extended Italian-American families. Yeah, my immediate family was fairly small, but lots of cousins, aunts and uncles. Right. I, I, I had all of my grandparents and five of my great-grandparents I knew, so wow. I, I, I did have a, That's great. A, a nice family life. Went to a, a Catholic boys prep school. Chaminade in Mineola. Went then like every good Catholic boy should to St. John's in New York. <laughs> I did. You did. In Queens. Yeah. And then uh, got your doctorate in philosophy at the University of Texas. Correct. And uh, you now teach and are the chair of the Department of Philosophy at Wayne State University in Detroit. Yes. You live in Detroit. Detroit proper? I do. Near 8 Mile. I, I'm actually very close to 8 Mile. Okay. I know about 7 1⁄2 Mile. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's called Pembroke. And, uh, it's true. Yeah. and besides teaching, you, you have a, a, a column called The Gay Moralist. You do, is that right? I, I, I did for many years at 365gay.com. Now occasionally I contribute to the Huffington Post and other places. Okay. Uh, and, and, and still sort of go under the, the name The Gay Moralist, but the weekly column has, has stopped. Okay do a lot of public speaking and uh, podcast and I have a new video series. Video series out and um, and are the author of several books, one of which, uh, both of which we'll talk tonight, one of which is called Debating Same-Sex Marriage, uh, written with Maggie Gallagher, and the more recent one by Ox from Oxford University Press, What's Wrong with Homosexuality? And um, we will talk about both of these books tonight. And uh, your partner, Mark, is here with us. He is indeed. That's great. Um, you guys married? We are not. Uh, we uh, have talked about this because back in 2004, when Michigan passed its marriage amendment, um, and, and not only that, but when the uh, there was a friend of mine who was in his 30s who died very suddenly, and it sort of made me start thinking about life and death and what were to happen if something were to, what would happen if something were to happen to one of us. Um, and at the time, uh, even though my family was very supportive, Mark's family had not yet sort of come around about our relationship. So we started thinking about what's going to happen if something terrible were to happen, but we what couldn't marry. Was this? this was 2004 that okay. Michigan passed its marriage amendment and many other states right. passed marriage amendments. So we decided um, that we were going to put together some legal documents and to the extent that we could protect our relationship and establish that we were a household unit. And so we went to a, our lawyer, who's also a friend of ours, and as we were going through that and signing the various documents, um, it was kind of emotional in a way. We were sort of, you know, this is what happens if you die first, this is what happens if I die first, this, you know, everything. And our lawyer said, you know, would you like to, when you sign the final documents, maybe have some friends and family around, you know, some, it's okay, but you know, we're not allowed to get married in Michigan, and I'm going to keep fighting so that we can get married. So let's be clear, this is not a wedding. We're just signing documents. Uh, and then you know, we started planning it, and people wanted to come. It's like, no, we're going to keep it really small, but you know, we'll have like champagne and cake, but it's not a wedding. You know, this is boutonnieres, but it's not a wedding. And, right, and it's really, right. I mean, it's, funny, it's funny because the, the documents <laughs> that I had for the ceremony, we exchanged vows and the whole bit, but the, the documents that I had. Uh, I labeled it on my computer as the Magna Carta to establish. We're just signing papers. This is not, not a, a not a wedding. And it was really funny because it, although I was insistent that it was not a wedding, um, it was very powerful and emotional to exchange vows mm. in front of close family and friends and to have these people. You know, I, I started to understand. You know, people say, "Oh, you know, it's just a piece of paper." And so on. There, there's there's something about that moment that's that's very powerful and special. And so then people would ask, well, you know, you, there are a number of states where you can get legally married, but, you know, I mean, going to Massachusetts or Iowa, that, that never had any resonance for me. When New York This is got not it, your home. It's not, not, yeah, not where New I live. York yeah, when New York got is. it, I thought, okay, this, this kind of makes some sense. And we started talking about it. But, mm -hmm. the, but then there was the whole issue of, well, 
you know, the people who were already there and saw us exchange vows, they went, you know, slept to New York to see us exchange vows again, and you know, right. feel, I don't want people to feel like they have to get us gifts, and you know, it's going to be expensive to do a big thing in New York, and, and so you know, par partially out of inertia and partially because we want to keep fighting for equal marriage rights in Michigan, we said, look, when Michigan gets it, we will be among the first in line, but I still don't right. feel like traveling somewhere to, to yeah. do Yeah, yeah, okay. And, it, and it's funny because some people, like, like Jim Garglow has publicly sort of gotten on my case, like you obviously don't really care about marriage because you're not married. I'm like, um, I'm as married as I can be in Michigan right now, yeah, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in your column the other day, you said that you uh, gave up something for Lent. Mm. What did you give up? What did I? <laughs> I gave up checking Facebook before 10.30 in the morning, which I know, I mean, it's like the ascetics, <laughs> the ascetics of old would be really impressed. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's like just short of a hair shirt, right? No, but I was, it, so, it, I was, I was so, so impressed when I was, I got to be your friend on Facebook, and then I realized you have like 9 million Facebook friends. Only 4,600 or so. But so, <laughs> you know, you I, checking Facebook is a big well, deal. Well, no, no, you know what it is. Not but before it's, 10.30. The thing it's, is, it's, no, it's the, it's the thing is, sacrifice, like friend. many people, I often go into the office, I turn on my computer, and you know, I, my, my home pages are you know, the New York Times, my email, Facebook. You know, and so immediately, it's like, well, I'm just going to check my email real quick before I sit down to it. It's like, oh, I'll respond to this real quick. And then check Facebook. Oh, that's it. that looks like an interesting story. And before I know it, it's, it's 11 o'clock or noon, right, and, like, right, and right, I've right. done nothing. Right. Um, and so I said, you know what, I really want to dedicate the first hour to my day of, you know, or so, you know, to really accomplishing something important. Not that, you know, just keeping up with friends is not important, but I it's really easy to fritter right away. What, 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 what interests me about that, about you, is um, uh, growing up Catholic, being a devout believer, being at one point, I think, interested in entering the seminary. I was a candidate with the Catholic Franciscans, yeah. Having taken some steps in that direction, and now uh, no longer being a practicing Catholic or a believer uh, in, in a conventional sense, but uh, wanting to uh, uh, remain connected to the sense of ritual and the reverence for the uh, certain forms. Sure. Is that yeah. the way to describe you know, I think, it? I think that's a good way to describe it. I, I, I'm not a believer. I, I identify as an atheist. Uh, but I have a lot of nostalgia for the religion in which I was raised. I had a very positive experience of, of my Catholic faith, and this yeah. is something I always want to make very clear to people because often people will assume that, and some people have publicly said that, well, you know, you know John Corvino, he figured out that he was gay, he had a bad experience with the church, he said, the heck with the church, I'm, you know, and, and, and it was not like that at well, all. I don't get that from you. No, it, no. it was never like that. Right. I, I, for philosophical reasons over the years, you know, gradually gave up my Catholicism and then my theism. Um, I, you know, I, I stopped thinking I had good reasons to believe, but I still have a deep fondness for um, the church, the, the, the people, yeah. the community, yeah. uh, and the ritual and, and the way that sort of taps into uh, some deeper human yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. How old were you when you came out as a gay man? I gay was 19. Male. You were 19. I, I was 19 and... What was that experience like for you? Yeah, I, so, you people ask me like, when did you we first... in college? I was in college. Uh, it was my first yeah. year of college. People um, sometimes ask me, like, when did you first know you were gay? And, and sometimes it's a hard question to answer because now looking back at my experience growing up, you, you know, I, I can see, okay, well, I had, a, you know, in, in, when I was in, in preschool, I had a crush on this guy and, and, and you know, you can sort of... But you, you look at those experiences through your current understanding, you wouldn't have thought of them in that way then. Um, when I was in junior high was probably the first time that I started identifying the sort of crushes that I would have as, as gay feelings. So but you're 14 or 15? Yeah, yeah yes. What, how, how, how old are you in seventh grade? I guess right. like 13, 14. 13, 14. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I was very insistent that I, I'm not gay, right? I have these gay feelings, but I'm not gay. I didn't have any straight feelings, and I can do basic logic. I mean, I, I was going to say that, right. uh, but but you know, it's, it's, it's could, a, have been, could have been an indicator. Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's a very it's a very familiar human experience, right? You can have yeah, ideas sure. over here and ideas sure. over here, and if you don't let them touch, and the you reason, don't have to draw the conclusion. The reason you were telling yourself you weren't gay was why? I believe there was something wrong with being gay. I yeah. believe that it, it that it would be a sin to act on this. So you're I fourteen. I'm, yeah. You have gay feelings, but you're saying you're but not I'm, gay. I'm saying not okay. gay, and and for you know for a while, first I kept that to myself. Uh, then I would talk to priests in confession who I would always say, you know, having the feelings, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't. 
act on it. Uh, again, I, I never had any sort of s severely negative experiences the way some people have had. I felt right. very lucky. Um, at some point when I was a sophomore in high school, um, my parents sent me to a psychologist. They knew that something was really bothering me, and I told them something was really bothering me, but I didn't want to talk to them about it. And How to did their they credit, know something was bothering you. I was, uh, um, I don't know. I was moody. I was upset. I was, I was telling them I, 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 the details of it. I don't quite remember, except that they knew I was upset about something. And it, I, again, this I, is I, in I, high school. This was a sophomore year of high school. Yeah. I, had, I had a crush on a friend, and. Um, I thought there was something very wrong with this, but I, so they, to their credit, didn't press, you know, push me to, to talk beyond what I wanted to talk about, but sent me to a therapist here, here in the city, um, mm -hmm. and she told me, uh, we don't think there's anything wrong with you, I mean, we, 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 you might be gay, but, but, but there's nothing wrong with that, and I wasn't quite ready to hear that at the time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I was in college, and I was 19 years old, and I had a, it was this St. John's, St. John's, here, John's. The city. Uh, here, here in, at St. John's, and it was, a, I thought of it as sort of my road to Damascus moment, you know, sort of being knocked off the horse. I was at a party at one of my theology professor's houses at the end of the semester. It was like a potluck or whatever, and we, bunch of, and there was a, a guy in my class named Tony, and I kind of had a crush on Tony, um, but I didn't think of it in those terms, because I remember I was basically straight. Um, gay feelings, but not gay. Gay feelings, but not gay. And I was talking to Tony at the party, and I realized that I wanted to leave the party with Tony. I, I have no idea what I would have done had I left the party with Tony. Understand, I had not had any romantic or sexual experiences at that I point. What Tony no, would have thought. I, well, yeah, you know, Tony, it turns out, is, is straight. So Tony uh, might have thought a few things, but <laughs> uh, it's probably good that we didn't find out. But, <laughs> but as I'm driving home from the party that night, and uh, as, I, you know, as, I, as I wake up the next morning, I had this very sort of powerful sense of, John, you're not straight with gay feelings, you're gay. And at the time, because I was very religious, I actually associated it with God speaking to me, right? As, as, you know, in prayer, you know, here I was reflecting on this. It's like, no, 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 stop lying. This is the truth about yourself. You're gay. And I... You're 19. I'm 19 years old, and... It was a really powerful moment for me, and and in part was it, how, was it a bad feeling or a good feeling? No, it was it was a it was a strange and unfamiliar feeling. It wasn't a bad feeling because, in the sense that, I had been carrying it with me for a long time. In yeah. fact, even a few years before, I had told a friend of mine, Martin, who it turns out was also gay, although I didn't find this out until years later. I I had even said to him at one point. If I'm gay, I'm not ready to acknowledge that. So I was, I was sort of like trying to, to crack open the closet door prior yeah. to that. But this was a, I mean, I was really kind of all of a sudden at peace with it. Um, in part, again, because I thought in the context of prayer and everything that this was God saying, you know, this is the truth about this who you are. This is a part of discernment of your, yeah, about embra yourself. Em embrace the truth about yourself. And, and looking back on it now as a non-believer, I think of it as you know, my conscience or my inner voice. But, mm -hmm. but it, was, it was about embracing the truth about who I was. Mm -hmm. And that was important to me. And so within a few days, I told a couple of close friends, including Martin. Um, I told my vocation director. Again, I was going, planning on going to the priesthood at the time. Um, and I told my parents. Mm. And I remember the night that I told my parents, which was shortly before they went to bed, and I knocked on their door and I said, can we talk? And I was shaking. I was trembling. In fact, in, in the early time coming out, like when I came out to my vocation director of friends, I would, I would always shake. Um, even with people that I knew would not ha have a problem with it. But, you know, with my parents. Shake out of just kind of general anxiety? And out of the anxiety. Yeah. Um, and my, you know, I, I have, have been and am very fortunate to have a wonderful family. And I think at some level, I knew that my parents would continue to love me uh, as their son. But there is this doubt, right? Because you know, once you, once you spit the words out, you can't quite take it back, right? This yeah. is, they're always going to look at you different. And I, um, I just, you know, I, I thought I knew that it was going to go well, but I just wasn't. 100% sure, and I was shaking, and I, I, I finally spit it out, um, and the f they looked at me, and the first thing they said to me, the first thing they said to me was, you're our son, we love you, we will always love you. The first thing. 
And then they said, don't tell your grandparents, don't tell your sister. Um, but I, I, um, I'm very grateful for that because I realize that many there people do no not. There was no but afterwards. There was no, but, but I mean, they, they, they really did say, don't go tell your grandparents, don't tell your yeah. sister. Um, yeah. And there were a lot of questions. And, yeah. you know, I sometimes say that my parents reacted to my being gay the way Italian Americans react to anything we perceive to be a crisis. We yell, we scream, we cry, and then we all sit down and eat. Um, and the idea is that at the end of the day, we're family. We can work out all the other stuff, but we're family. We sit down at the table, we eat, we share a meal together. Yeah. We're family. Yeah. And you know, there wasn't a lot of yelling and, and screaming and crying. There, there were a lot of questions. I mean, understand, David, this was the late 80s. Um, gay men were dying left and right. I mean, I, when I finally then, sometime after that, started going to gay bars, you know, I, I would meet people. Um, and then a few weeks later, I would notice they'd have like lesions, and, and a, a month or so later, they'd be gone. And so a lot of us were, I mean, one of the things my parents were understandably very frightened about is, Your oh, my God, oh my God, you're going to die of AIDS. Yeah. Um, and we were Catholic. Um, my parents were always sort of, you know, thoughtful Catholics. They didn't accept everything the church said just because the church said it. They, um, but, you know, it was part of their tradition, and they believed uh, that, you know, sex out, you know, Sex outside of heterosexual marriage was, was was wrong, and so we had we had to work through all of that. But the yeah. good thing was is that I came from the kind of family where we did work through, and we, we would talk about it, we would argue about it, we would yeah. we would um, ask each other questions, and and I've and I've got to say, I I mean, of the things that I am grateful for in life, that's one most of grateful. Them. I mean, I, I am grateful for my relationship with Mark over eleven years. I am grateful for having come from a loving nurturing family because not everybody not everybody has that experience and yeah. I, I know too many gay people where you're a son we love you we always love you is not the first thing out of the mouth not the second thing out of the mouth maybe you know maybe the first thing out of the mouth is get out of this house yeah um, and that does serious damage to people well I <coughs> I uh, our mutual friend Mitchell Gold uh, gave me his book uh, about crisis about teens, right. uh, gay teens, and I learned <coughs> from that book and in conversations about the much higher rates of teen suicide among uh, gay kids and thoughts of suicide, and um, I, I don't know, I mean, th there was a, you know, so, so, some, some say that the, this fact is attributable to a kind of existential or intrinsic, there's something sort of intrinsic about being gay that causes one to uh, uh, consider Think taking life one's life. Yeah. That, yes, and then uh, the <laughs> argument also, however, is that there, there are uh, important social influences such as how your parents accept you and how your family and community, how your pastor, whether your pastor says, well, that was going to send you to hell or whether we still, uh, you know, you're, a, you're an accepted member of this congregation. I mean, that matters. And so I don't know if that, you it know. It matters in a huge way. And even as somebody who came from a loving and accepting family, and even as somebody who had overall a very positive experience with the church. Yeah. I still thought that there was something unnatural, sick, perverse. I mean, I, I would go, you know, nowadays I guess you know, people can go on the internet, right? We didn't have an internet. This was, this was the 1980s. Uh, so I'd go into libraries, and I wouldn't take out books because you didn't want to, you know, I would sneak around and see if I could find books about human sexuality um, and, 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 and read what I could. And, you know, some of it was, you know, stuff in psychology at the time that was, that was more positive, but, you know, but some of the stuff that I read, it, in moral theology, you know, perverse, unnatural, um, you know, that, that this was somehow the work of Satan. I mean, we hear this today, right? Um, A sin our, that cries yeah. out to heaven. Right. I, yeah. You know, our mutual friend, Glenn Stanton, whom I've traveled with and, and debated many times, um, you know, he wrote something on the Focus <coughs> on the Family website. Um, and then he says, you know, all sexual sin goes against God, but homosexuality is a particularly evil lie of Satan. Um, and, you know, for those of us who grow up gay, yeah, it's one thing for, for pastors to say, look, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have temptations. But there's a big difference between the normal 
temptations that your friends have to look at pornography or to masturbate or have premarital sex, and the abnormal, perverse, particularly yeah, the, 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 the ones that are a particularly, you know, the, 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 the kinds of things that are a perversion that make God literally sick, and the damage that that idea can do to a young person's psyche. And again, I was very fortunate, but I still had to work through it. I mean, the work that you, you see with, with the new book and, and, and the other work I do, in part, is my working through all of those arguments yeah. that I had read and, and heard about. And to I some think. degree, internalized. Internalized. Yes. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I have a, a, a guy I was talking to once, a gay writer, he said that he <coughs> experienced his homosexuality as a mild disability. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like <coughs> something almost a, a, the anal analogy would be to have a mild but overcomable physical disability. Like, like I'm, I'm deaf in one ear or something? Yeah, or? something like um, that. What do you make of that? You know, I think probably at first I might have been inclined to characterize it that way because, again, I, I, I mean, it, it, it was strange for me because at the time I came out, understand that I was planning on going into the priesthood anyway. So, And, in fact, that was part of my parents' reaction. It's like, well, you're becoming a priest anyway. I guess it's not an <laughs> issue, right? <laughs> you're um, covered. You're covered. <laughs> um, and, when I, and then when I left the order and, and started, you know, actually dating guys, it's like, okay, this is, wait a second now, this is, this is something else. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think that um, if you go through life thinking that the way to be happy is to find someone of the opposite sex or someone of the other sex and get married and settle down and have children and you come to realize that that is not open to me in quite the same way. And, and, you know, and at the time, I mean, I would think that, you know, that, that was not open to me at all. Now, now these days we see same-sex couples forming families, adopting children, ra you know, raising families. And of course, that's very controversial. It's one of the things that we discussed the last time I was here. But you know, I could see why somebody would, would find it a, a mild disability not to be able to form a family and to um, produce children with the person that they love. I, I, mean, I, get, I mean, look, heterosexual sort couples of, who are sort of um, sort of uh, sort of being one with the heterosexual majority of the sure, universe. Sure, so sure, sure. So, so, so that you have to face additional challenges, questions, and so on. Um, there are a lot of heterosexual couples I know who want to have children and for various reasons cannot have children. They experience that as a mild disability. So yes. I suppose you could say, in a sense, the fact that Mark and I can't produce a child, I could see why somebody would think of it that way. I don't think of it that way. I don't experience it that you way. You don't experience your own homosexuality as a, as a, disability. As a disability of any kind? No. Okay. No. Because uh, maybe it's because it, I never aspired to producing children, to having. I mean, maybe because by the time yeah, that I would have so, known. You said something the last time we were here, really stuck in my mind. Okay. And it kind of leads into the discussion of marriage. I, I, I don't know if I can. Uh, I don't know if they quoted it the exact, but you said something along the lines of, and you were saying it in, a, I think, a humorous way, but you said, gee, I used to think that being gay meant you didn't have to get married. And, right, right. and that what you're supposed to do is just, you know, enjoy your life yeah, and we, have we, vacations we, we on go, Fire we, Island. You know, and, we, we go on cruises. Yeah, we watch yeah, some yeah, anonymous yeah, sex. We yeah, gentrify yeah, bad neighborhoods. Yeah, this is yeah, what yeah. we do. This is, this is <laughs> That's the, the gay lifestyle gay, I was uh, signing project. up for. <laughs> no, yes. I, 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 yeah, I was joking. Um, <laughs> um, it's a good line. Uh, no, I... Um, but, 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 the, but the truth but, is, okay, here's but the grain of truth take, in this. Take that, yeah. take that at a serious yeah, level. At the serious and level. And reflect on it as, a, um, as both part of your own journey, what, however, whatever that journey right. has been, but also maybe give it a social context. Because sure. we're going to talk about this broadly. Right. Yeah. So the serious part of that is that um, I... When, when, I, when I finally came out and when I started dating men and so on, it, it just did not occur to me that what I would eventually do is settle down with a man and have children. Now, part of that may have been because in my own personal history, I, you know, from the time I was maybe a sophomore in high school till I was a sophomore in college, I had planned on going into the priesthood. So that, that you way of thinking being, about it anyway. Yeah, that way of being an adult in the world just was, was not something that I had embraced. Uh, and, of course, the fact that I had 
decided to go into the priesthood and, and not form a family and so on may have been influenced by the fact that deep down I knew that this was not really an option for me given the way the world was at the time. It's not an easy option for me, the way the, way the world was. I've heard me. other um, people, gay people, say this, that they had a feeling when they were young that there were just, they didn't say, I'm gay. What they said was, something's going on with me that makes it highly unlikely that what most of these other people are doing is something I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm I've heard this over and over I'm, again. I, I, I felt, for, for a long time, I felt different. And, and by junior high, I started to understand what that difference was. But yeah. I felt the difference before that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, 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 when, you're, when you're young, you want to figure out how to have a happy future. And, and so how do you do that? You look to models of it. Well, I look, you look to, my, my parents have a happy, they have a good marriage and, and family, but that's, that model is not going to work for me somehow. So, yeah. so there was another model available of religious life. And, and, and I, I found that appealing partly because it would give me community and a way to live a, as an adult and, and a res be respectable yeah. and so on. Partly because I, you know, I, I deeply believed yes. in my Catholic faith, and I wanted to help people. I, you know, I, you know I, I went into the Franciscans. The Franciscans were, were very concerned with you know helping the poor and the needy and the outcasts. Our, our, our new pope, I say our new pope. See that is, <laughs> 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 you can take you can take the boy out of the church. Um, our, 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 uh, has, has chosen the name Francis. Um, so so that, I mean, all of that was appealing to me, but but I recognized our motivations are often mixed, and for me. Part of it was that I knew that there were certain other paths that were not open to me. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you meant when you said, oh, I thought that was not what you, uh, so I thought being gay meant this other uh, so thing? So what I, what I meant was is that I find it funny now when I meet people and, and they say, so do you, Mark, think about having children? And I say no, and they're, and they're like, why not? As if the default setting is that we would. And I think actually kind of the default setting is that we don't, at least in my own mind, because uh, now, I realize that there are a lot of gay couples who do want children. That the default is that because of your personal choices or because you can't have children sexually? I, mean, I, I, su I suppose, I, look, I suppose anybody could adopt children, and I think that that is an admirable, wonderful thing to do. Um, and so I guess there's, there's nothing in the default setting about being gay that, that forecloses that uh, possibility. Right. But... I've begun to understand much in a, in a much more visceral way what straight couples must go through when they f feel pressure to have children even though they're not particularly interested in having children. Because not everybody should have children. Not right. everybody wants to have children. Right. Not everybody right. would be right. great at having children. Um, and, you know, I, I probably am guilty of it myself. You know, years, like, you know, sort of asking my sister when I was going to be an uncle. And, and, and now that people are starting to ask me, well, come on, you know, you and Mark, you know, what, 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 what. It's not really part of our, our, our life plan. Uh, I, I admire those who do it. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I am deeply excited about being an uncle, and we love our nieces, and we're mm -hmm. involved in their lives, and mm -hmm. we support them in, in various mm -hmm. ways, and, and, and that, that's great. But, um, but I do find it interesting that, and maybe partly, maybe largely as a result of the progress in the marriage debate that people sort of assume, well, you know, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. So, you know, when, when are you and Mark going to get working on that? Yeah. But it's not, but what I'm trying to get at is that your um, decision that that's, or at least for now, that that's not what you want, you would, you would view that as a, um, just a personal choice. You're right. not making an ethical cons statement about right. the needs of children of some kind. Right, right. No, right. I, I, I think children need loving homes, and, and if we were inclined to do it, uh, particularly to provide a home to, for children who don't, uh, didn't otherwise have a home, I think that, that would be a good thing to do. It's just so adoption, yeah. 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 Um, now, <clears throat> as, you, as you know, one of the big components of the gay marriage debate that you've written about and we've talked about often is what will happen to marriage as a result of gay people entering the institution and you know 
Maybe we can talk a little bit about that, but what I mainly want to do is flip that question around and ask, um, uh, or at least p include the other piece too. That is, if it's possible that gay people are going to change marriage, is it also possible that marriage is going to change gay people? And I'm just wondering if you have a, 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 a sense about that. That is, as uh, as uh, gay and lesbian couples in what is it nine states now in the District of Columbia are actually marrying so it's no longer on merely on the outside fighting for access it's in a significant portions of America have won access and are now marrying I'm just wondering how that changes um, oh, how that changes uh, gay America, or does it? Um, or, or, or is the or is the causation going to go the other way? Is it that gay people are going to change marriage, remake marriage to be something kind of what gay, or is it true that marriage is going to change gay people? How does that work? Right. Your so um, it's funny when you, you invited me to come do the talk under the title, you know, will gays change marriage or m will marriage change gays? And my initial reaction to this is, I don't know. I, I, this is a, partly because this is something of a social science question, maybe empirical question, predictions about uh, what, what history will look like, and, and, and it's sort of yeah, out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, let's but, stipulate but, that we can't really know yeah, because yeah, we we're too right, early right, in the yeah, process. So, but, um, but then I thought about it more, and I thought, you know, th this question can be understood in a number of different ways. And, and take the, you know, will marriage change gays? So one way of understanding that is, you know, from the perspective of individual couples, does getting married change things in some way? And I have to say that from my own experience, even though I'm not legally married, standing in front of family and friends and exchanging vows and committing to, to love, honor, and cherish someone all the days of your life, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that changes something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... By the way, I think as you probably know, the social science evidence uh, bears at that out. That is that there is, um, in addition to the private love commitment between the lovers, the public and bringing in friends and family and for people of faith bringing in, their, bringing in God, that that uh, public quality of marriage affects how you think of the relationship oh, sure. and how you think of yourself as a uh, as a person on your life journey. It, oh, sure. it affects behavior and attitude. We are social creatures, and yes. particularly for somebody like yes. me, for whom family has always been so important, um, bringing family into this in that way mm -hmm. by, by standing in front of them and making a pledge in front of them is very powerful. Uh, you know, the, it's funny you mentioned the social science uh, data. I, I, I've been checking my email on my phone all day because I've been running around New York uh, doing different things uh, in, in preparation for this, and uh, been getting emails from Maggie because apparently there is um, a new Danish Maggie study. Got the same you email. got the emails, okay? So I, I causes I sort of, cancer. Yeah, yes. Gay marriage causes cancer. So no, <laughs> it's it's it. Well, it's it's. <coughs> so uh, again, I was reading it quickly. You probably read it more thoroughly than I did. But the, the basic idea is that there's this new 30-year study out of Denmark that suggests that same-sex couples getting married actually doesn't benefit them in the way that uh, heterosexual couples getting married does. That in fact, um, we see that when the same-sex couples marry, they're more likely to, you know, lesbians are more likely to commit suicide or have cancer. And I'm I'm just looking at this and saying. I've got a few questions here. I need to look <laughs> more carefully. But but I you know I, I was reminded years ago um, there was this uh, commercial for Excedrin or Anison or some pain reliever um, where there's an official looking guy in a white lab coat <coughs> going through all the data about you know how this gets rid of headaches and he's like you know but I don't I'm not cons really concerned about charts and graphs. I care when my headache goes away. Yeah, it's like so that's right. you know you can put a, a study from Denmark in front of me. I know from my you, own experience, you had this experience what it was like with to, your spouse. to yeah. commit. And then, don't just, I mean, the, ma marriage is more than the wedding. You know, marriage then is the, right. the day in That's and the day right. out, and right. you know, 11 and right. a half years together. Um, 
And, and, and I know how that transforms me in a positive way. Um, and I, I mean, it's also like, I mean, just think about it. Like you said, when you came out in the mid to late, late 80s, mm -hmm. it was at the, one of the, the high, uh, the high tide of the, the AIDS crisis. Of, of the AIDS crisis. I don't know the reasons why this has happened. Uh, maybe you have a better sense, but but there has been. And I'm certainly not pretending to be some expert on gay America. What a joke! But um, okay, here's my observation: a kind of um, embourgeoisment. You know what I mean? A kind of mainstreamization. And when I was on the other side of the gay marriage issue, I thought this was kind of PR tactics. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought this was kind of like oh. Yeah, put some nice people up there to say they love marriage and apple pie. Put us in suits and ties. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now I tell you, man, I don't see it this way. What I see is um, uh, not just on the marriage issue, not just people wanting not only access but wanting to actually be married. And there's a f odd way in which the most pro-marriage people in the country today or gay couples who, you know, I mean, in terms of the public affirmation of the importance of marriage, but also more broadly, um, you know, to to a straight, you know, to straight people, at least in my world, twenty years ago, if somebody said gay, I would have thought of, you know, cr cr crazy behavior. Sure. Gay, you know, I, I, I and now I think of, you know, people who aren't that much different than I am. The nice couple next door. The, you know, like you look at look around at the PTA meeting, right, you know, right, right. and and so that's what I'm calling a kind of mainstreamization. And 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 some, as you know, some gay critics think this is terrible. Yeah, sure. Maybe you think it's mixed. I don't know, but no, I don't. Look, here, two things I want to say in right. response to this. One is that, you know, I, I grew up like you, um, a, 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 I think a little bit younger than, than you are, but, but growing up in the 70s and 80s with this image of the homosexual lifestyle. I, I'm which about is, 15 years older than you are. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so uh, growing up in the 70s and 80s with this, you know, the homosexual lifestyle, and it was portrayed. That's right, the homosexual this, lifestyle. Portrayed right. as this very frightening thing, you know, this kind of an outburst yeah, of uninhibited sexuality, yeah, bathhouses uh, and, and, and confrontational you know, parks and yeah, yeah, sure. Bathhouse culture, yeah, right. um, an, an a, a joyous affront to all bourgeois norms. Yeah, no, and, 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 but but also that that, that there was Sound something good? sort of deep <laughs> and unhappy, uh, you know, yeah. deeply sad about it. I mean, if you if you watch a, a movie like um, uh, uh, Boys in the Band, um, uh, which is based on a play. Yeah, you know, the people just seem really un ultimately very unhappy. Um, and when I came out in, in the 80s, um, there was still that perception, but as I got to know real life gay people and wasn't just basing this on my, my uh, image that I had, had, had internalized, it's like, you know what? All along, there were plenty of gay couples who, despite the odds, settled down and set up house together and cared for each other yeah. over in, in good times and bad. And I think, look, one of the things we saw from the AIDS crisis, you know, when people think of the AIDS crisis, you know, they, they tend to associate it with, you know, sexual promiscuity. In some ways, I think the AIDS crisis um, accelerated the movement for marriage because it became very clear that we did not have legal protection for our relationships. You'd see somebody die and the family who had you know been estranged from the the the, the, the dead person for for a decade suddenly swoops in changes the locks on the doors tells the partner it's like you ha this don't nothing, exist yeah, you, you don't exist right you know you, you, we're, 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 t we're tearing up the the photo albums and and just you done nothing and the gay community really had to come together and build networks of support and build family and find ways of protecting the networks that we had. In which the, happened. Yeah, and which, which happened. Yeah, which happened. But it did not have, you're saying that out of that, res, out of that communal response to a health crisis, 
emerged a recognition of some <coughs> kind about marriage? What, what I'm saying is that there were, there were already people in, in long-term committed relationships. There was a recognition that these had no legal standing or legal protection whatsoever because if people would die, other people, virtual strangers, would, but technically family, would come in and, and take over. Um, and so, so, so part of it is it had been there all along. We didn't see it quite as much. But I also think that you know, in the 70s and 80s, and certainly before, <coughs> as you're telling people that this is sick, unnatural, perverse, as you're telling people, you got to keep this a, a deep, dark secret because if anybody finds out about this, your career is ruined. Okay, that's not really conducive to, you know, setting up a nice house and going to the PTA meetings. With you know, that that's conducive. It's a little bit to, of a conflict there. Yeah, that you, yeah. You, you you've got to you, you become convinced that all right, to the extent that I'm going to have any kind of romantic. Um, satisfaction at all, it's going to have to be an clandestine, outlaw, an outlaw, and furtive, under, yeah. under wraps kind yes. of life. I mean, so, I, sometimes I say, you know, as I, to my uh, conservative friends, you know, uh, who's, who, who are now on the other side from my own view on the right. gay marriage issue, I, you know, you say, well, gee, let me see. On the one hand, you're, you're saying that uh, uh, Homosexuality is a, just a kind of a seedbed for a promiscuity, libertinism, and uh, you know, uh, self-centered behavior. And on the other hand, you're saying you want to deny an institution that is, a, is, is among other things, an antidote to all those things. Right. right. Uh, no access t to you. Right. For the you know. So is there a there is a, there's a very is clear there conflict. a conflict yeah. there? There's, um, there's very much a conflict. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying yeah. I endorse the stereotype view, but you know what I'm right. trying to say. Sure. That, that look, you know, if you want people to be part of mainstream culture of commitment and long-term care and concern and so on, don't define them outside of the realm of, of mainstream values by saying, look, you, you you can have nothing to do with this. But I want to go back to your question of will marriage change gays, I think probably one of the most powerful ways it, it does is it says to gay people, particularly to young gay people growing up, you know, happily ever after is something that you can aspire to. Being welcomed by your family and having your partner welcomed as a family member, that's something that you can so aspire to. So when you to. were a kid yes. and you were felt that you were uh, had gay feelings but weren't gay, but you also had this feeling that was a negative feeling that there were some important parts of, of life's flourishing that you saw people around you doing, and you had an inchoate uh, anxiety or, or determination or, or some conclusion that this was going to be not something that you could do. Right. Are you are you you're saying that net for the next generation of gay kids? They won't think that. Many of them will not think that. It's going to get much better for them. Uh, th those attitudes that, that I heard and that you heard back then haven't disappeared. Um, kids are still hearing from their pastors and their family that there's something sick, perverse, and unnatural. I mean, this is something that we have to remember. I think that even among, I mean, we, you know, you're seeing new polls where like 58% of Americans in support of, of marriage rights for same-sex couples in some polls. Um, even among that 58%, there's still maybe people who say, look, if gays want to get married, let them get married, but better not be my kid because that, that, that's weird stuff there. Th there are still these negative attitudes out there, and kids still hear them, um, and they will still have the sense of this is something I better keep a deep, dark secret because if my mm -hmm. family finds out or if my pastor finds out, I'm in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So I think, it's, I think it's much better than it was when I was growing up. I mean, even just you're in terms of seeing successful... People, you know, certainly, you know, seeing the, the, the op openly gay people next door, or other gay people in your family, but also, you know, I mean, you, you can dismiss uh, sort of like, oh, what, what does it matter with Ellen and Anderson Cooper and so on. But when, you know, when when I was growing up, Elton John hadn't even quite come out yet, right? He was sort of <laughs> yeah, in and out, just kind of. Um, so, seeing those examples of, you know, what um, that life. This kind of life is possible for you, mm -hmm. to, you, know, you to, to flourish mm -hmm. and be happy and to be welcomed in community. 
Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference because again, we're social creatures and we need to know that. Yes, yeah. My colleague Barbara Whitehead um, has been doing um, historical research, really not pursuing some gay theme, but just in her historical research she points out that there have been many considerable previous examples in American history where groups of people who were kind of um, on the margins of society, kind of either radical religious groupings or people who kind of either kept out or were outside the mainstream, joined into the mainstream um, largely through the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, that it just works over and over again. So Mormons, for example? Yeah, she brings up that example, and she also brings up the uh, 19th century, these uh, Baptist and um, Methodist uh, uh, communities where they were characterized by these circuit riders who were quite radical in their religious beliefs, and they were all uh, single uh, men who kind of went from community to community uh, causing uh, all kinds of uh, ultimately disturbances and their their religious communities and the communities they were serving ultimately said look this is not quite the way we want it to be we want you fellows to to settle down and get married and have families and serve your serve the parish in, in this way which eventually happened uh, much to everyone's uh, ha ultimate satisfaction but what but it, it diminished the um, the otherness it diminished the otherness of what was happening. And you could, you know, in, as in the case of gay, you can also say, well, that's bad. We, we like other. We like outsider. We sure. like outlaw status. But for many people, I mean, the way I look at it ho with a hopeful eye, uh, you know, is that there's a sense of um, participation uh, greater participation in the mainstream of American life because I'll tell you man that the, the the institution itself of marriage is in such trouble has been for a while now almost entirely uh, you know of course it's all heterosexuals who who weakened it right you you people haven't had time yet to right. do, do any damage but uh, we're working on you're working yeah we're but uh, but you know with such high rates of family fragmentation, high rates of father absence, particularly among lower middle class, blue collar, low income people, I mean you have a, 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 a kind of a massive deterioration of the marital institution. So you have a small number of Americans who are fighting to gain access to this institution and then you have a massive number of Americans who are just exiting, just exiting. Well, this is a, in large part what your new your new marriage conversation this is about. This is what we're trying to do, and we, you know, we're trying to bring together. Um, and, and I really appreciate it that you that you were a part of this, that you were signatory to this. You know, so you try to bring together people who are, um, uh, you know, willing to break bread with with um, gays and lesbians who are pro-family, social and religious conservatives who are willing to do that. Um, liberals who are no longer worried about being perceived as anti-gay because now it's it's not, and um, gay and lesbians, gays and lesbians who don't only want access but want to participate in the institution and maybe even maybe even <laughs> leave it a little better off than it was when you first gained access. You know that then that's this maybe it's utopian but. I'll tell you, man, I've been in this thing for 20 years now in the, in the, in the rot that is set in institutionally in terms of single parent homes and father absence and um, just the ripping apart of the social fabric that's come from the failure of the institution. And then, you know, for, for years we've been preoccupied about this one culture war issue of, you know, are guys like you going to be allowed to get married? Well, how, could, can we have a new conversation you know, so the, the reason I'm the reason for ten, the reason for this thing tonight is I want to want to pr push you to say as much as you can about the role that gay and lesbian America can play in potentially in this broader 
renewal? Well, as you said, I mean, because we've been pushing so hard for marriage and have probably been more powerful and more articulate advocates for marriage than most others lately because, you know, other, I mean, we're, we're trying to explain why it is so important. You say right? that with no sense of irony. I mean, to me, it's it's true, but I'm, it's, it's, I'm still, my head's spinning. Well, I, you know, I, I, like, I've been you trying to make like, a case for marriage and why it's important. Yeah. And, 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 and I stand on the shoulders of people like our mutual friend Jonathan Rausch, yeah. who um, was making that case um, beautifully. Uh, I, I, I've, I've learned so much from him. You Andrew, know, now, Andrew Sullivan. Now on our board. Jonathan. Which, and, is, which and, is wonderful. Uh, Andrew Sullivan, dating back to 1989. Yeah. Whenever so. it was, whenever most people, straight people, I mean, everybody I knew thought it was just a, a completely eccentric and untenable idea. Right. So, but, but, the, but these are people who didn't just make an argument for gay marriage, they made an argument for marriage and why it was important, why it's, why it's important for society to get behind people as they connect with each other and aim to sustain relationships over the long haul. Why that's good for the couple, why that's good for society at large. And um, you know, these, these people I just mentioned have, have made a very eloquent case for that, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, and so it seems, in a way, given that, very natural for them to come in and sort of talk about, hey, you know, maybe, Marriage. Let, let, let's talk more generally about why it's important, what it needs. Uh, Jonathan uh, says, I mean, I'm trying to put <coughs> words in his mouth, but I've heard him say that he kind of wants, wants the day when people don't say gay marriage anymore. Mm -hmm. They just say marriage. Sure. And s right. some are some and some are the other, you know, right. but marriage, you know. Uh, is that well, well, yes, because I mean, what. What, what gay marriage suggests is that we want some different institution. Right. No, we want marriage. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I go to the, yeah. the Department of Motor Vehicles to get a driver's license, I don't get a gay you driver's get a license. Gay I license. Get, you know, when, yeah. I, when I'm hungry, I don't have a gay breakfast. Well, it's brunch. <laughs> but um, uh, the, 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 the idea is that by calling it gay marriage, we're, 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 try, we're suggesting that it's a kind of special <coughs> right. We're feeding, feeding into that special rights rhetoric. We know we, what we're looking for is marriage. We want to commit to having to hold for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and, and we want society to recognize that, uh, recognize us legally as a family unit. Yeah. Um, I want to do now a lightning round. Okay. Where you give short answers to impossibly big question. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So th this is the, this is the part where people like quote out of context and send around the internet. John Corvino John said. John Corvino <laughs> said. No, you know it's it, but it's really funny because um, you you know our our our, our mutual friends uh, you know, Robbie George and Sharif Gurgis and Ryan Anderson have their book What is Marriage? Um, and you know I and I, I got the book having followed their work for some time and, and you know, I, I admit it I, one of the first things I do when I get a book like that is I flip to the index and of see course, where I'm mentioned of course you do. <laughs> because I want to see yes. I want to see and um, check the C and, and, and do, do, they, do, they, do, they, do they do they talk about my, my compelling arguments in debating same-sex marriage oh, no, no no do they do they they talk about serious objections I've raised to their view no it's always even John Corvino admits that. It's always like they find some point some, of agreement some, and, and, and then like thing. use me as the well, example. It's, it's, and I just started to think my name is even John Corvino. Even, even John, John Corvino, Corvino has said no. that. <laughs> William F. Buckley once sent a, 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 a copy of his book to his, uh, conservative Buckley sent a copy of his book to liberal uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. And at the, at, at the index under Galbraith, he wrote, Hi, Ken. Because he knew that Galbraith was going to go back and see where he was. He said, Hi, Ken. That's good. Okay. Lightning round. Uh, how much opposition to gay marriage today comes from moral disapproval of homosexuality? A lot. More than fifty percent. So you want more than just lightning? <laughs> uh, no, I, look, I don't. I don't know what it is in terms of numbers. I think that there is a lingering idea that there's something wrong with these relationships, and whether that's moral disapproval. Is it the disapproval. single most important driver of opposition to gay marriage, or you don't know? I don't know, and I and I don't. One of the things I don't like doing is sort of armchair psychology of what's yeah. driving my opponents. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
For people who say that I disapprove of homosexual conduct, if, if I told you I was such a person, do you believe that that means that I have animus towards you as a gay man? I don't think it, it means that you have animus. I do think that uh, it's something that you would need to dig more deeply about because I do think that that view is harmful and wrong. Uh, now, does that mean that everybody who holds that view is a hateful bigot? Da, da, da? No, clearly not. Um, but the idea that there's something wrong with our expressing our love in, 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 in a romantic and sexual way is, is a problematic view and, and something that I argue strenuously against. That's a large, large part what the new book is about. How do people become gay? If, if one extreme is biochemical substrate and the other extreme is social influence, how do people become gay? Seedless watermelon. <laughs> no, no, actually, actually, in, in all seriousness, I, I don't remember when this was. I think maybe it was in, in the 90s. The, the Iranian parliament actually passed a, uh, a resolution about seedless watermelon because it caused homosexuality. Um, uh, I'm not making that up. I don't uh, talk to Southerners about watermelon. Yeah, right, I'm sorry. Sexuality. <laughs> no, know, look. I don't know, um, man. <laughs> you know, I, I did this new video series, and one of the videos uh, it's on, on YouTube is entitled Born This Way. And I, and I argue yep. in that that I, I neither... We have a chapter in your book... Called Born on, This Way. On this and and, and my, my position has always been, in fact, it was one of my first published pieces, I neither know nor care whether I was born this way. Um, do I believe that there is a strong genetic component in sexual orientation? Yes, I think that the evidence for that is quite clear. But strong genetic component in sexual orientation does not mean that any given individual is completely genetically hardwired to have the sexual orientation that they do. There's a lot more to sexuality. And I think that a lot of the uh, discussions of this are really simplistic in trying to set up. It's like a either dichotomy. it's nature or a, it's a, nurture. A, a, a boxing match yeah, yeah. Either between I, nature and nurture, nurture as if one has to be the complete explanation. Well, be, be, particularly since um, you know nature happens in an environment, right? I mean, you know, right. nature doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's interactive, um, like yeah. two dancers. Right. It's, yeah, it's yeah, a, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. Um, but I still stay away from seedless watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, do mothers matter uniquely for their children? My mother certainly. Uh, does, as, as does my father, uh, as do many of the people in, in, involved in my life. Um, here's what I want to say about this, and I want to be very careful because I think this is going to be one of those, even John Corvino moments, and, and, and I, so I want to... No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> not, not from you, but yeah. you know, from the, the people but out you, there. You know where I'm going. I know, I know exactly I'm where you're going. I'm going with it, as you, yeah, 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 some I, people I, may wonder. Yeah. As you know, where I'm going with it right. is the question of... Um, uh, married, two, two uh, uh, men married, um, uh, let's say the most extreme example, uh, not the most common, but the most, it makes the point the most forceful, uh, using surrogacy, third party procreate, third party assistance to have a child who will never know his or her biological mother. I'm asking you to, to reflect ethically upon that sure. in light of the, uh, in light of whatever you want to put it in light of. Sure. All else being equal, I get the fact that people often want to know the mother and father who created them biologically. That there's there's something about those biological connections that is important to to many people. That doesn't mean that other kinds of connections are not important. It doesn't mean that adoptive families aren't real families. It doesn't mean that that should be an overriding factor that just makes all other factors irrelevant. But I certainly understand that that's important to many people and so that I can see why all else being equal, it is valuable to be raised by and to get to know um, the mother and father who created us. But that's an all else being equal claim, and all else is often not equal, 
Uh, and I can make all else being equal claims about a lot of things. I think all else being equal, it's better to have grandparents involved in your lives than not to have grandparents involved in your life. But I'm not going to tell people whose parents are deceased you can't get married. I'm, I'm specifically talking about mothers now. Mothers, yeah. Okay. No, so, so, you, so I mean, I, we, could, we, we could bring this back to fathers, too. I mean, that's, that's, that's the more common concern, right? Fatherlessness has, has been um, a I've spent a concern. lot of years um, <clears throat> pushing on that issue, books, everything else. I was like a fatherhood jukebox for about 10 or 15 yeah, sure, years. Sure. Um, you know, it's when relatively recent, however, the claim in any human group, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic about this, but I want to push you a little bit on it. Sure. It's relatively recent in human experience to allege that the mother-infant bond is somehow optional for human thriving? It depends on what you mean by this. Are there people in the world who thrive who do not have that bond as infants? Yes, sure. Do we think that all else being equal, it's better to, to have that opportunity? Yes, I would say yes. You know, it's funny, when I did the, the book debating same-sex marriage, one of the things I wanted to do particularly since I don't know a lot of same-sex couples with children, and I, I, and I think that that's in part because people with children tend to hang around with other people with children. We don't have children, so we hang around uh, mo mostly with, with childless couples, both straight and gay. Um, but I wanted to sort of paint a picture of what this looked like in the real world. So there's this couple I know, Tom and Dennis, live yeah. just outside of Ann Arbor, and I said, you know, can I come visit, talk to you a little bit about your experience? They're raising five boys that they adopted. Uh, in fact, maybe there may be a six now. They had a, had a foster child, um, and I, I just want to sort of like get a get a sense of your experience and, and write about it in the book. And mm. while I was there, you know, it, it's strange because you, I'm not used to being around kids. I'm not very comfortable asking kids questions about their personal lives and, and what. Um, so, but at one point after the kids left, I, you know, I turned to Dennis and I said, "Do you ever worry about?" Or did the kids ever ask about, you know, sort of not having a mother in their lives? Uh, because, again, I, I had a very close relationship with my mother, still do. I have a very close relationship with my father, still do. Yeah, you're yeah. part of one of these, uh, you know, big extended families, right? Yeah, sure, Blood sure. is thicker than well, yeah, nearly any known yes, substance. Yes, right. So this yeah. is, uh, you know, and this is, uh, was the main concern. You know, we're, we're family, and, and how, do we, how do we work this into that? Yeah. But... Um, so I asked him, I said, well, what do you, you know, and he said, well, it depends on what you mean by mother. He said, when I think of mothering, I think of nurturing and concern and sort of the values and practices we associate with mothering, and the kids get that. Now, he said, in terms of their biological mothers, in some cases, that those biological mothers are around and the kids still get to know them. I mean, at least mm -hmm. one of his, mm -hmm. one of their kids, yeah. They have custody of the kids because the mm -hmm. biological mother was taking the child's ADD medication and selling it to buy herself drugs, yeah. Yeah. right? So, yeah. so all else being equal, would it have been nice for him to have a? Would it have been nice for him not to have left his his home of origin? And um, see, it's different. Sure. I mean, several times in this conversation, you brought up the example of adoption, which I, I really powerfully resonate with. Right. It. Um, Adoption is a little different right. in the sense that an adopted child, by definition, has experienced a loss right. of, the, of, of his or her by, you know, in other words, some tragedy has happened. Mm -hmm. We all acknowledge it's a tragedy. This child has been separate because the, the biological parents are either incompetent or they're dead or they mm -hmm. don't care or some terrible thing has happened. And then the adopted parents step in like <coughs> angels of rescue, sure. you know, to provide love for this child. But nobody wants every child to be adopted. Right. You know, it's a it's a it's a compensatory right. institution. Right. Um, where, whereas, but you're concerned about people going out and creating new life, um, with without intending for you know that that new life to um, involve the either the mother or the father. And I'm asking violence. you to reflect on it. Right. Uh, and, reflect and, on that in the, in the case of the mother bond. Yeah. Okay. And so, what I, mean, I would say to, it's not a setup question. Sure. No, I, I, I don't. I don't think you, you would. Yeah. You would give me a setup question. Um, what I would say is that these are difficult questions because I do think that there is something very special about the mother bond. But what I insist on even more, and the reason I don't 
talk about this much or write about it much uh, or, or investigate it as, as, as a moral issue is that I don't think it's relevant to the marriage debate, which is my thing. And the moment that I start mm -hmm. talking about these issues, then people in the marriage debate start quoting, even John Corvino says this, that, and the other Why thing about do you surrogacy. Why it's not relevant to the marriage debate? Because people don't need to be married to use surrogates. It's funny, I was in a discussion right. earlier today and, and, I, and I found myself making exactly this point. Right. You don't need, um, uh, gay marriage doesn't add or detract from anyone's ability to do this uh, right now. The way, the way I put it in the book, and, yeah. and, and I put it as a, as a joke line, but, it, but it's not joking, it's like, banning same-sex marriage does not cause lesbians to go marry their sperm donors and form traditional families. Yeah. Okay, it, it, it's not going to change that. So there are these children in the world. The uh, they're in loving be, families. The argument that it, 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 the argument is it affects uh, sort of the, at the level of symbolism and, and uh, uh, the kind of iconography of the marriage culture. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I see that. But I get that. I, well, anything else you want to say on that? I, I, I appreciate it. Was a, <laughs> it was a good answer. Well, no, I... I, I, and I, I didn't mean to push so no, hard. No, I... I I, I look because I mean it's here's the, the thing, David, and here's what I always appreciate, yeah. I've always appreciated about you, is that these are these are difficult questions, and there's a lot of nuance, and there's a lot, um, and so often it all gets sort of sucked up into this, you know, either or kind of either you're completely for all this or you're completely yeah. against all yeah. this, and and yeah. you've always been somebody willing to grapple with nuance and competing goods. And and to to do this sort of like all else being equal, it would be much better to do it this way. Yeah. But 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 maybe you know there are these yeah. other considerations. Yeah. Um. And and I want to do that too. And uh, you know, as a philosophy professor, you know, yeah. I, I'm trying to. Well, you to just did. I'm you trying to train did. people yeah. Yeah. to sort yeah. of think about these things in a nuanced way. Yeah. Um. And yet, uh, not everybody in the debate is quite so scrupulous. And. Uh, and, and, and look, I mean, just like I get the even John Corvino thing, you get even, the even David Blankenhorn. In fact, our side used to do it to you for, for years Every before, day, you, man. before you switch. Every before you switch. Day. Even David you Blankenhorn. See my scars? Yeah. Even David Blankenhorn acknowledges yes, the equal dignity right. of homosexual yes, love. And even yes. even David I Blankenhorn. You, I did it in the book. I bet says you did we it yourself. Said that we would be more American yes. the day oh, we allow oh, same-sex oh, marriage oh, than the oh, day before. Oh. I like. I ran to the the the. the, man, the my, I went to see. You know. I went to see a few months ago. I went to see eight. Okay, yes. And, uh, well, oh my gosh, oh. I, I haven't seen it, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about it. You're, oh. you're, you're in that, aren't you? Am I in it? Oh <laughs> right. God. Oh, um, that was a. Well. So this, this is about the for, 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 for viewers at home yeah. who do not know. This is about the Prop 8 trial, yeah. of course, yeah. uh, which you were the the, the lead, the, the sole witness, really, yeah, well, for for the other side. Yeah. Um, the other and side. The other, what, what, I call, what I call the other side, <laughs> right. for the uh, for the pro prop eight side, yeah. um, and, uh, and and I understand um, uh, that uh, yeah the eight. Going to that play was a real interesting experience for me. We'll, we'll talk about this another day because I just want to finish two more minutes on our lightning round, then I want to open it up to get a few sure, questions. Sure. Um, and I'm, I, I apologize in advance for asking big questions and asking you for short answers, but here goes. These are topics that you discuss at considerable length in, in, in your book. Yes. Um, the Bible teaches me that homosexuality is a sin, and that's all I need to know. Right. So, as you, there's I'm a, saying, you yes, 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 right. So there, there's a chapter in the book called "God Said It, I Believes It." I believe it. That settles it. Um, and the whole point of that chapter is to press back against a sort of simplistic, well, here it is in the Bible, that, that's all I need to know, because, you know, we've seen throughout history people take that to approach to a lot of questions, to, to slavery, to women's roles. And this is not to say that all of these issues are the same, and one of the things I talk about is the use and misuse of analogies. In fact, I have a, uh, one of my YouTube videos right now is on the race analogy, because a lot of people get really worked up, and I remember you, we were at a meeting some years ago, you got really it. worked up about... Well, you talk about it in your book. I do, yeah. Uh, and, and so... Um, so what I, what I want to say there is that, I mean, my own view, and I'm very open about this in the book, is I'm not a believer, so I don't really have a dog in the fight about the Bible. But if we are going to, to and, I, and I do think there's a lot of wisdom and, and beauty in the Bible. I also think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of problems in the Bible. I mean, there are 
to my eye, clear endorsements of slavery in the Bible. God himself says, Leviticus chapter 25, verses 44 to 46, you may acquire male and female slaves from the among the nations residing with you, and they may be your property. All right, that's a problem, um, to put it mildly. Um, so, and, and, and it's funny because I, I got into a thing the other day on, on Facebook with somebody, well, was among my 4,000 Facebook friends. I hope it wasn't friends. before 10.30 in the morning. It was morning. not, it was, after, it was after Easter, so <laughs> I, was, I was good, I was okay. But I, um, I got into a thing because uh, this person was responding to one of the videos and, and saying, you know, the Bible says such and such, and I pointed out, well, the Bible says this about slavery. And then this person came back with the usual line of, well, slavery didn't really mean slavery back then. It was more like, you know, uh, th and it's like, well, well first of all, opening. I said, I said, first of all, it says they may be your property. That kind of sounds like slavery. <laughs> but if you're going to do all these hermeneutical gymnastics to say that slavery doesn't really mean slavery, then I'm going to do the same ones to say that when they talk about man lying with man, they've got something very different in mind than what we're talking yes. about. And in fact, that's true. Yes. So. Okay. <clears throat> I love the sinner. I hate the sin. Yes. Uh, on the, this is, I, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, leading with the message of love is a good thing, and all of us are... I liked it in your book when you said that. You said that when every, and anybody tells you that, your first, in, first response is one of gratitude for the expression of solidarity at the human level. Sure. That's a very decent thing for we, you we, to say. We, well, we all make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope that people are able to love flawed people or else no one would be able to love me. I mean, you know, Mark will tell you I've got lots of flaws. Uh, and um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we, thank goodness we can love people in spite of their flaws. But number one, and this is the big one, you know, I, I don't think that there's good evidence that homosexual conduct is a sin or wrong in any way. Number two, the attempt to separate the sin and the sinner here. Um, is problematic and, and, and oversimple because sometimes what we do and who we are are intimately connected and that's especially true when we're talking about the fundamental relationships around which we organize our lives. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we call these people our significant others. And so when people say, look, it's not you I have a problem with, John, it's your homosexual conduct. It's like when you're talking about my homosexual conduct, which makes it all sound so weird and scary, I mean, what is that? Um, you're talking about my relationship with Mark. You're talking about the affection we express for, for each other. You're talking about something that is part and parcel of my life. It would be like, you know, it's like, Mom and Dad, I, I love you, but it's your, your heterosexual conduct. It's like, what, your, your, your marriage, your life. I mean, this is something that's deeply a part of your identity, and, and the love the sin, hate the sinner thing misses that. Because it divides out it imagines that there are one or two or some small number of physical acts that are what's at stake rather than your life. Right. I, well, you well what do you, this is a real question here. So what is the sin, right? Is it, I mean, they, they, when people ask me about homosexual conduct, I say, well, what is heterosexual conduct? Intercourse? Okay. What about... Kissing, well, sometimes. What about holding hands? What about making a candlelit romantic dinner for someone? What about going for a walk on the beach? Uh, what about you know checking someone's Facebook page every hour because you have a crush on them? It's all heterosexual kind of. Um, but yeah, yeah. All, yeah, but all these things yeah. that we do that make up our romantic lives, mm -hmm. all part of the conduct of our romantic lives. But when we talk about same-sex relations, we focus very narrowly on homosexual conduct and, and, and have these sort of weird ideas. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you, you don't tease it all apart, that, that these things are continuous with each other in important ways. I'm going to open it up and let people um, ask a question or two. David. Uh, I have two questions, and I'm trying to figure out which one I want to ask. Maybe you could ask both. Well, <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> so I want to ask you a little bit more about the... Um, the mothers and father, mothers and fathers, and relationship to children and so forth. See what you set me up for. <laughs> <laughs> this is the gotcha part. <laughs> no. Um, what, one of the things that I've been thinking about is that it's kind of funny that, to me, how in a sense, um, gay marriage seems to me to be an argument that about how marriage and children are not related. Uh, they're, they're 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 separate, and therefore we can have gay marriage. Maybe you disagree with that. 
Uh, but in another sense, it seems to me like, um, uh, yeah, as you were talking about earlier, because you were talking about how now that you know, you've been in a relationship for a long time, that people are starting to ask you, oh, you know, when's, when's the child going to come along? And you feel this kind of pressure. And so it seems that, that still, that um, with, with gay couples, that there's kind of this expectation of family if you're going to get married and so forth. Um, I'm wondering, you know, for, for those of us who, are cons who think to ourselves, well, even if there's gay marriage, we can still try to uh, regulate you know, reproductive technologies and make it, try to make it really rare that these practices happen and encourage gay couples to you know, choose adoption over it. Um, but do you think that will be harder to do because of the kind of expectation that, well, you're married and therefore you, know, you, you have family? Or will, um, would it be okay and seen as just fine you know, for to say no, you know, gay couples should respect the the bond between mother, father, and child, and therefore, if they want children, they should think about adoption. Right. So, um, I don't think the pressure to have family is the same as the pressure to produce one's own offspring. Uh, that is to say, I think that when many people say, you know, have you and Mark thought about extending your family? They don't necessarily think that we're going to do it by finding a surrogate. I think they mo more likely think that we're going to do it by adopting. Um, mm. And now, now it might be different if we were lesbians, right? Uh, because uh, it is more common and easier for, for lesbians to have their own children by reproductive technology, by going to sperm banks. Um, but even then, I mean, I, I think the questions are separate questions. So even though I, I I agree, and at least my own experience suggests that the more we have access to marriage, the more people will sort of expect and ask, you know, well, have you thought about having children? That that need not translate into having our own biological children. Um, but I also want to go back to your premise at the beginning about gay marriage means that marriage and children are disconnected. I don't think so, because I, I, there are and always have been infertile married couples, and I think of gay couples as a variety of infertile married couples. So, so that marriage can still be very importantly about children. I mean, this is something that, you know, early on, Jonathan Rausch, you know, made very, very clear. It's like marriage has multiple purposes. Children are a very important purpose, you know, protecting them. As a, but there are other purposes as well, even for people who don't happen to have children. Yeah. Just on one point, I was wondering if you might agree with me. I know early on that I definitely was left-handed. And I was convinced, really from that time until now, that it is absolutely and totally from uh, nature. Because I know my parents were right-handed, all my siblings were right-handed, most of the kids in my class, when I learned how to write, were right-handed. Sister Rose Alma, who taught me how to write, was right-handed, but I was left-handed. And I know that I didn't affect or take anything away from them learning how to write right-handed. So I didn't affect them. And I think it was very, very much <coughs> from, from nature. And I kind of tend to think that that could be transferred towards orientations very much. That it really is from, from nature, because I, I don't think you can transfer from one to the other. Just as though many wanted to change left-handed people to write with their right hand, in many cases it didn't work, and it wasn't necessary because that's who they are. Sure. What do you think? Uh, respectfully, I, I don't agree. Um, <laughs> uh, so so, let, so let, me let me explain why, and I talk about this a little bit in the video. Uh, on Born This Way and in the chapter there. Part of it is that I think that there are two separate questions that get jumbled together here. One is uh, a question of etiologies, like how did I come to have this orientation, whether it's handedness or, or sexual orientation. So that's one question. Another is, can I change it? Do I have control over it? So there's a question of the voluntariness of it. And those things vary independently. So, you know, I, I am 
genetically hardwired to have dark hair, but I could change my hair color. I could dye my hair blonde. <coughs> I am not genetically predetermined to comprehend English. That's something I acquired. But now that I've acquired it, I can't unacquire it. I mean, short of a lobotomy, I will continue to comprehend English. I could learn other languages. Um, they probably will never, at this point in my life, I'm, I'm almost 44, uh, will never have the character of my native language. But it's an acquired trait that has become a very deep part of me. Now, I think you're probably right that your handedness is uh, something that's pretty well genetically hardwired. Uh, but that's because of what we know about handedness and, and, and scientifically how that works. Um, as far as my sexual orientation, I mean, it's not like through some act of introspection I can see my own genetic makeup. What I know is that for as long as I can remember, I had a certain kind of attraction to boys that I didn't have to girls growing up. But as long as I can remember isn't from the moment of my birth. It was like, I don't know, you know, I can have memories from when I was four, you know, I can start at five. Um, and I wasn't shrink-wrapped in plastic before that time. I had an environment. And, you know, even beyond the genetic uh, factors, there's influences in the womb, hormones, all that. I think sexuality is a very complex trait. Um, there are, I think, what, at least 15 genes that go into to eye color, dozens that go into human height. But you know, when it comes to sexuality, we think, well, this is this gay gene. I, all I know is that it's a deep part of me. I've had it for a long time. It's not something that I can change. Uh, the evidence doesn't you know, suggest that that's, that's something that can readily be done. Whether that's because of genetic influences or a combination of genetic influences and other things. It's, I mean, certainly genetics has some part of it. I mean, I'm a flesh and blood mm -hmm. person, after all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think those questions are more complex. Sam. Uh, well, uh, in addition to the people um, in this room right now, uh, as you know, we're joined by an online audience. And um, uh, <coughs> Mark Ford, our director of the Center for Marriage and Families, is uh, moderating a discussion um, online. And so she's been emailing questions, oh, wow. questions from our online viewers. So we're going to take an online question. Well, hello, hi, Elizabeth, uh, and all the audience <laughs> out there online. <laughs> um, Nicholas um, asks, uh, do you agree 50 years from now that gay marriage will be the new normal? Uh, I think that by 50 years from now, <coughs> we'll have it across the country, yes. Probably considerably sooner than that, I, I would hope. As far as the new normal, I mean, I, but, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't really. <laughs> But in regards to the political influence of gay marriage here in New York, how do you feel, how influential do you feel the gay community in New York has been in the fight for gay rights? Um, and how politically active do you feel like they have been in general? Yeah, as somebody who lives in Michigan and has been there for 15 years, it's a hard question for me to answer. I would, I would defer. I'm sure there are other people in the room who probably have more to say about that than, than I do. Uh, in, in fact, if, if some of those people want to speak up, that, that they should feel free. Um, uh, you know, I, I think what happened in New York uh, happened, you know, through a coalition of a lot of different people, both New Yorkers and people out, outside of the state, certainly. Um, uh, but I, I, but I can't really speak to the specifics. Okay, and in relation to Detroit and being in Detroit and kind of seeing it from an outsider's perspective and being from New York, um, how do you feel like that has made an influence and how do you feel like that can influence? Well, you know, it's funny. General. People have often said to me, you know, you grew up in New York. It's such a you know, progressive place. I'm like, yeah, but I grew up on Long Island, which is kind of, I mean, New Yorkers have all different experiences. I mean, even w within Manhattan, depending on what neighborhood you're in, whose family you're in and, and so on, you, New Yorkers can have radically different experiences of, of, of the world. Uh, even blocks from each other. So, yeah. Yeah. so I think that the fact that it is now possible for same-sex couples to marry legally in New York is powerful, not just for, for New Yorkers, but for people elsewhere, because people look to New York as a, as a beacon for the rest of the country. Um, but, but I also think that um, that powerful effect doesn't sort of automatically change everything for everybody, because people's mm. surroundings... Uh, uh, vary within that culture. Thank you. 
Yes. What are the financial ramifications of, of same-sex marriage, of gay marriage? As a, the ramifications of people who oppose it, what's in it for them financially? What's in it for the people, for people who support uh, same-sex marriage? And how will same-sex marriage affect the financial state of the United States? Is money really tied into this whole debate? Wow, this is really kind of outside of my wheelhouse. Um, but um, look, I, initially I thought you were asking, maybe this is part of your question, about sort of the financial implications of not being able to be legally married. I mean, one of the cases currently before the U.S. Supreme Court, yeah, it's not was not your question, okay. But I'm going to talk about it anyway, because I can say something. <laughs> <laughs> Answer the question you wish that was asked. Rather than the question is, I learned from watching presidential debates. No, um, I, you know, one of the cases currently before the U.S. Supreme Court is a case uh, about you know, a woman who was with her lesbian partner, and I guess before the partner died, maybe they did get married. Maybe they, um, and as a result of their not, as a result of their marriage not being legally recognized, uh, you know, she had to pay you know, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in estate taxes. And you know, those of us from the outside might look at that and say, "That's not a bad problem to have," <laughs> <You know? laughs> because because what, imagine what right. the number had to be right, for the taxes right, exactly. to be three hundred fifty. Exactly. But you know, it's it's so, it was. Yeah. But you're but you're asking a rather different question about what about the, financial what about impact. The, what about the um, the uh, claim, uh, maybe truthful, I, don't, I mean, it may be accurate, I don't know, but what about the claim of pro-same-sex marriage um, groups and leaders that um, uh, those parts of the country that are prohibiting same-sex marriages, you know, there's going to be, this is not good for business, you know, this is not oh, yeah. good so for if we compare new business startups. This is not good for tourism. This is not good. Sure. You know, there's an, in other words, there's a, and there's been the threat of boycotts. Sure. Uh, uh, Susie Orman might leave Florida, right? I mean, right. I saw, I saw, I saw right. this in the news the other day, that if, if yeah. Florida doesn't yeah. get its act together on this issue. Um, but, 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 but there, I mean, it seems to me that... The National Organization for Marriage wants to have a boycott of S Starbucks. Yeah, good, good, good luck. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I don't, no, I don't mean to. Be, yes, I do mean to be dismissive. Who am I kidding? Um, no, I. Um, but that just suggests Wanna that the money would Chick Fil A. After right. Right. Well, we'll go out for Chick Fil A yeah, and yeah. Starbucks <laughs> afterwards. It'll all, it'll all even out somehow. Um, but that just suggests that the money would move from some places to other places. And yeah. I, yeah. So so. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but here's right. but here's the here's the thing. I mean, we have an. Ex I'm a, a, a department chair at Wayne State right now. We have a, a, a case at Wayne State where we're hiring somebody. Um, who has a same-sex partner. In Michigan, we do not recognize same-sex marriage. The hire is American. The partner is Canadian. Uh, we had to go through all these sort of questions. Well, are they going to live in Detroit? Are they going to live across the river in Windsor? How are we going to... And a lot of energy is being spent, mostly by them. You know, also, we're trying to help them. Most of them trying to like work all of this stuff out so that they can like live together as, as two people who love each other. And, and my view as, as an administrator is and all of that energy that they're having to spend that is, is not energy that they could be spending toward positive things, yes. like you know, contributing to the, yes. it's to the community. It's uneconomic. It's a, yeah, sense. right. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 it's a waste of yeah. time yeah. and energy yeah. when we have to jump through all these crazy hoops in order to do something simple like live with the person that we love without you know having to cross a border to Canada, yeah. um, and so there there are there are there are certainly economic implications like that that, yeah. that people need to pay attention yeah. to. Yes, anyone? says about this or is it just easy to say no oh know, sure people don't because, know what the bible because, actually because says then they don't they don't go to the next aisle and say well the bible also is very clear about divorce you know am i going to hate the sin and love the sinner in that in that case um, yeah the divorce point is really interesting um you know jesus is very clear that uh, to divorce and remarry is tantamount to adultery and you know 
adultery is a violation of the Ten Commandments. It's taking you know, serious penalties of course, for adultery. That's still Catholic teaching. That's still Catholic teaching, and so instead there are annulments, which are not supposed to be. You know. the, the point is, is that conservative Christians and, 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 and conservative religious people of various stripes have a very different attitude toward, say, you know, Rush Limbaugh or Newt Gingrich, who have been married multiple times, than they do toward same-sex couples, even though if you take the Bible at its word, you know, those people are persistent adulterers. It's not like they, they made a mistake back when they got divorced and now everything's fine. It's like, no, they are well, persistent adulterers. When I was on the other side of the gay marriage issue, I don't think I had a different attitude. I was uh, highly critical, as I still am, of that uh, of that uh, behavior. Yeah, but you're unusual, David. Well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. uh, no, I mean, in, in this, you were also... Um, Somebody who respected the equal dignity of homosexual love, as you put it. I, I, when I, and when I say I have a different attitude, um, take a case that, that, that I wrote about, um, that Maggie wrote about, uh, you know, the case of Dinesh D'Souza, who was president of, of King's College here in New York. He um, was married but separated from his wife, went to a conservative Christian conference with his Kings is a good friend. I mean, we, we have yeah. good relationships with right. Kings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with a, I, I guess, a girlfriend. Uh, you know, his, uh, I, I don't want to say he was his mistress, right? But you know, he was separated from his wife. He was, with this, he was with this was other woman. His wife. A woman who was not his wife. Is yes. the, the polite, you're a southerner. You know yes, the way to put right. things very politely. A, a lady woman who friend. Was, <laughs> a woman who was not his, his wife. Um, and people were sort of like, oh, my God. And he eventually re resigned from his, his post as president mm -hmm. of Kings. And one of the things that Maggie pointed out in, in a column that she wrote about this is, look, we know how this would have ended if, you know, if, he, if he had not done this sort of silly thing of bringing her to the conference. And he would have divorced his wife, married her, and everyone would have been just fine. But if you, you, know, you take what the Bible says mm -hmm. very, very seriously, yeah. people shouldn't be just fine. It's like, wait, no, that, that guy's a persistent adulterer is what they ought to be saying. Yeah. If, they, if they take the sections about divorce in the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. literal way I'll tell you, man, I, I really feel like, and maybe you're a, a guy because of your religious, you know, uh, tra training uh, in early your earlier years, be a part of this, but I, I really think there is a need for a kind of a deep re, kind of theological re-examining about a lot of these issues, starting with what the Bible says and doesn't say, because I know a lot of... Um, and now I'm wearing my kind of new position of, of you know, pro-gay marriage. Um, a lot of people say, well, we just have to bring political pressure on people to change their minds, and we have to tell them that they're on the wrong side of history, and blah, blah, blah. For religiously serious people, this is a religious question. A, you have to go through the theology, the theology. You can't go around it and say, oh, people will be mad at you. Or people will, the, uh, p pr you know, upscale people will look down on you. That can bother people, but it's not going to bother them enough to change their religious views. Sure. You have to deal with the religion issue directly, um, uh, which is why I, I like this part of your book uh, very much. Um, and, the, and let me say there are insiders who deal with the religious question directly who can, can do so in a, in a more intimate way than I can. I mean, yeah. could, Gene Robinson has a book out recently. I haven't yeah. read it, but I have have the book. One of the things that he was saying, we, were, we participated in a forum at, at Pastor Jim Garlow's church with, with Jennifer Morse and Rob Gagnon, um, and, and Gene, you know, brought up the topic of divorce uh, and said, you know, this is what it says, but many Christians seem to have a different, he's like, how do you thread that needle? Yeah. And then once we learn how they thread that needle, it's like, well, okay, now, yeah. now let's use some of those techniques yeah. over here, yeah. uh, too. And, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of work to be there done. Needs there needs to be, a, I think, for, for all of us, right, a, a kind of a, 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 a serious theological, historical, scholarly re-examination of the religious sources on this. Um, for all of us, maybe for different reasons. I mean, I'm, not, I'm a non-believer, so, you know, to, to, to me, I think we need a healthier dose of religious skepticism in the country, too. But I get the fact yeah, that yeah, these yeah, traditions yeah, are, yeah, are deeply yeah. important to people. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, it's been great. I really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of the conversation. I really appreciate you being a part of our, um, what we call this new conversation on marriage. And um, 
Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Thanks yeah. so much for Thanks having me. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.